Ace Podcast. Hello and welcome back to another fantastic episode of Vaguely Accurate. I'm your host DK and today joining me on the show is Erica Sasori. She is a science fellow at Bush Heritage Australia. Her field is marine science and she was also 2016 award winner for Fresh Science in Perth for investigating stromatolites. So she's kind of got a background in marine geology, marine ecology, bit of conservation. As far as her career goes for someone on this show, it's all over the shop. She has been everywhere and it was a delight to talk to her. As some of you may know, Mike's background is in marine science as well, which is probably why this episode went on a little longer than normal. But yeah, I just want to say thank you, Erica, for having a discussion with me. It was fantastic to talk to you, and I hope you guys all learned something new, much like I did. Now, before we start, we've got two small announcements. As always, check out Ace Podcast. They're a fantastic network with a great variety of shows, everything from Dungeons & Dragons playthroughs all the way to political debates and science interest, which probably fits nicely in the middle. And yeah, if you're interested in getting in contact to do your own podcast or even grow your show, get in contact with the guys. I'll link all the uh, contact details in the description to this episode. And lastly, I'd like to ask for a little help from you guys. I want to jazz up this show, so I want some fantastic intro and outro music. If any of you that listen out there are a bit more musically inclined, whether it be digitally or acoustically, and want to get your showcase your musical talents on the show, please, it would be fantastic if you were to just script a bit of music for us, play it, send it to us, and you could win a t-shirt, and also your music would be on the show for the seeable future. You never know how big this might get. So if you're interested, I will contact me, and I'll forward you more details if you're interested. It would be great. Anyway, guys, I won't babble on too much longer. Check out the show. Thank you for very much coming on the show. Uh, <laughs> so you're, you started off in geology, doing an honours in ge- geology and a degree in that. Um, bef- could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what motivated you to start a career in that? Uh, so I, I actually um, started in, I actually started university a long, long, long time ago to me mm. um, in Ohio. And then I did a bit in California and then I did a bit more in Ohio and then I did a bit in Germany and then I passed around quite a bit and then I did a while where I didn't, I didn't work at all or I didn't go to school at all. I, um, I lived in Alaska and I lived in Las Vegas. I did some commercial photography. I did some fishing in Alaska. I did it. I did a bunch of really random things. And uh, then finally, when I was in my mid twenties, I decided I wanted to go back to uni Yeah. and I did. And I finished at Miami and I went back as a marine biologist. And uh, then found geology along the way, and then changed into a geologist. And um, then I then I, I did go on and, and do my PhD um, at the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, which is part of the University of Miami. Yeah. And stromatolites were kind of a good compromise because stromatolites are rocks that are accreted by bacteria, essentially, mm-hmm. and that kind of is biology making geology. Yeah. So it was a good marriage. So for a long period of time, you were like the most intellectual, unqualified person in like the most diverse person. You've been great for science trivia and just taking you to a pub quiz would be like, I don't have any formal qualifications, but like, I've got a good background in yeah. everything. Uh, yeah, jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. 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 So your initial research was in stromatolites that you said. Could you explain yeah. to us and the audience what exactly is a stromatolite? Okay, so um, a stromatolite is, well, first of all, I should say that stromatolites are probably the most important things on the planet. Mm-hmm. Really, they're why you and I exist today. Um, stromatolites, the oldest stromatolites on the planet, are in the fossil record, and they're dated now to 3.7 billion years old in in Greenland in the Ishwa Formation. Wow. And there are some also in Western Australia that used to be the oldest ones, and they're around 3.45 billion years old, and yes. they're up in the Pilbara. That's incredible. And, and that was only this year that they found the ones in in Greenland. So WA did have the <laughs> it kind of knocked the, the off oldest. the podium a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they are the first evidence of life in the fossil record, and it's just bacteria, simple bacteria, coming together, forming a community, and that community then um, they make uh, they make they make a goo like a it's called exopolymeric substance or EPS, and it's like a sugary like goo. Mm. It's kind of the goo of life, and it acts as 
um, a protection from sun. It acts as a goo where the microbes can communicate to one another um, and it keeps them from drying out because they live underwater, these communities, and they photosynthesize. And that stickiness catches sand grains as they move across them underwater. Mm -hmm. And so the microbes, they can trap these sand grains and then they bind them and move up to the top so that they can photosynthesize again. And so that builds rock so over time. That's how it happens. But also, they, um, they make their own cements within the goo. So um, photosynthesis, taking in carbon dioxide and, and putting out oxygen like trees do. Yeah. So these are like billions of years of, of microbes that are acting like trees, pumping oxygen into the, into the, well, into the ocean and then subsequently into the atmosphere. That's which incredible. Which evolved the atmosphere. Yeah. Which is allowed for evolution. But here I can off on a tangent. The, um, but that taking out of the carbon dioxide shifts the reaction, like shifts the balance so that then a cement comes out. Like think about your um, carbonate is, is really special. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm a carbonate sedimentologist or a microbial carbonate sedimentologist. Um, and I look at carbonate rocks. And carbonate is, um, calcium carbonate specifically, if you think about a hot shower, like you take a hot shower and you often get lime. Yeah, the that, lime scale that's often associated, the white kind of yeah. pebbly substance you get in the shower. So that's hit. carbonate. Yeah. And it's most things in hot water like to dissolve. And like think about ice or think about um, any, any kind of mineral you put in hot water, salts, anything, you know, they just like, they dissolve in yep. hot water and in cold water, they tend to like come out of solution. Mm -hmm. Carbonate is opposite. So in cold water, it tends to dissolve mm -hmm. more and in hot water, it tends to come out of solution. So that's why you get it on your shower head and things like that. So that's, a, that's another way that these are making cement. So you've got an equilibrium shift that's making carbonate come out. You've got hot water making carbonate come out. You've got all these different factors that essentially mm -hmm. have to be just right. It's, it's the Goldilocks effect the Goldilocks where effect. everything is just right. So, and they're building these structures. They're building towards the sun, making layers, growing up, growing up, growing up. So these stromatolites, um, they were obviously started growing, like you said, millions of years ago. And when they excrete Billi billions, billions, billions <laughs> oh, sorry, and they, start, and they excrete this goose like substance, mm -hmm. are they one, are they still growing now? And also, can you use these stromatolites or their as a fossil or carbon record to track back, date back to prehistoric times, I suppose, or pre pre prehistoric times? Yes, y yes, y yes. <laughs> There's a lot of questions in that. Yeah. Um, so I started off working in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. um, which is an active marine system where stromatolites are growing today. They're about 2,000 years old, or they started growing about 2,000 years ago, and they're still actively accreting. Um, that's an open marine system. And I've worked for the last five plus years in Shark Bay, in Hamlin Pool, up the coast here. Yep. And that's an active system, which is actually a phenomenal system. It's the, it's the most abund abundant and diverse system that's living on the planet. There's probably over 100 million stromatolites in Hamlin Pool. They cover around 135 kilometers of coastline. And they're also about 2,000 years old. They started growing then. And they're still active today. Um, there's some other marine paratidal systems in South Africa, but the, they're paratidal. They're a bit different. Um, and there's a lot of lake systems, like here in WA especially, there's Lake Thetis, um, Lake Clifton. I always say this one wrong, but what, what, do you know it? Walgara? Wal, 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 Walgara? I, I always say it wrong. Maybe. Walgara? Down, down south of... Oh, Earth. yeah, I know exactly what yeah. you mean. I can't say it. I, I, know, I never you say need must, You need to be Australian to say yes. it. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. You get any foreigner that tries to say it, and it just doesn't work. Yeah, so there are some there. It's like Mangjigajugara, if you've ever been to that. On the way to Mandra, oh, the, the one sign that just that goes picture. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, yeah, I, I couldn't say that if I tried. So there's a bunch of lake systems all over, and mm. uh, there's a few marine systems, but they are still active and, and actually allow us that window into early Earth. Yeah. Um, the fossil ones, obviously not growing, not active anymore, but they've captured that lamination. They've captured um, that. It's kind of like a trace fossil. Yeah. Like like a dinosaur would, would leave a footprint. It's not actually the dinosaur that's yeah. left there, but it's evidence the dinosaur was there. It's kind of the same with the stromatolite is that usually, I mean, in, I think it's like in less than 1% of fossils that, stromatolite fossils that we have found, you can find fossilized bacteria. Mm. But it really it's just evidence 
that that bacteria was there making these laminations in the rock record. But this bacteria that was in it, it's cyanobacteria, if I'm mm-hmm. correct. Um, which That's was, a community, though. It's a community. Yeah. So they have cyanobacteria itself or the community. It's, it's not one just type of bacteria. It's a no, combination. It's, yeah, but in... So in Hamlin, for example, you you get a dominant form of bacteria that's in the mat. Like some of our subtitle mats where it's less diverse, you get like a big community of all sorts of cocoids and mm. filamentous cyanobacteria, all sorts of bacteria, yeah. and they come together. And as you move towards um, like higher up in the intertidal where it becomes more and more extreme, you get obviously uh, the diversity goes down. Yeah. So some of those mats are, are really dominated by one particular kind of bacteria. But I mean, it's a range. But the interesting thing also is in that in that less than one percent in the rock record where you do find fossilized bacteria, there are fossils. I think they're around two billion years old, and it's from a formation in Canada. And the the fossil, the main bacteria, is Aoentophysalis, or the fossilized bacteria that was found is Aoentophysalis, and the dominant bacteria in Hamlin mm-hmm. is Entophysalis. Oh, wow. So you're talking about a bacteria, you're talking about a lineage that's, that's b- billions of years. Like that's that's bigger than I can wrap that's my brain incredible. around. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's for a geologist. So your time scale is skewed compared to everyone else's already. Um, something is probably a bit of a segue, but like you said, it's a single lineage possibly that's evolved over the... Mm-hmm. That's my question. Have they evolved in any specific way to adapt to our climate? Or is there any... Well, I traceable think, evolution. I think it's it, it, it's an interesting question. And I'll probably spin it in a different way. Yeah. That if you look back through the rock record, through Earth history, actually, and you, so now we've got fossils that are at three point seven billion years, and so Earth started what about four point five billion years, yeah, take and then probably the first bacteria maybe five hundred mil, five hundred million years after that maybe I don't know, but we first find bacteria in the fossil record at three point seven billion. So that's, what is that? Where's my math? That's uh, 7 billion years later, 8 billion years yeah. later, whatever it is. Or eight, sorry, 800 million yeah. years later. We find it in the rock record. Then in the next, what would that be? 3 billion years? Is that right? Yeah, I need to like give a chart here to look at my... You've got up, up, in, up into the Cambrian explosion. So the Cambrian explosion happened the, the, on the geology timetable. That's 542 million years ago. Mm-hmm. That's where you start to see life radiate. Yeah. So you've got stromatolites. So these microbial communities that are building structures in the rock or just microbial communities in general, dominating over 3 billion years of time. That's like, incredible. You've got to be a resilient organism in itself to survive mm-hmm. that long. But then you have the radiation of life. And all of a sudden, this abundance and diversity that you see of stromatolites in the rock record just goes, I mean, it really just pinches out. You, it's gone. Because you get this higher life that radiates, mm. they are better competitors, macroalgae, things like that, that come in. They're better competitors they, um, they're for space. Mm-hmm. They, maybe they munch on the bacteria. They, yeah. you know, so they're grazing them. They're, they're out-competing them. They're, maybe the nutrient in, in the environment changes. Like, yeah. All of a sudden, you get these, these environments that, that are, there are more evolved organisms that are better equipped so to the, survive there? So the bacteria itself is, I hate the term, but it's, it's primitive. It's simple in itself. And yeah. that's what's kind of encouraged its longevity to survive over this period. But um, now it's competed out a little right, bit. Right, right. So now it gets pushed back to areas where things can't live. Yeah. Like look at Hamlin, mm-hmm. for example. Hamlin Pool is where I work. You've got a 22 degree temperature span over the course of a year. Mm-hmm. You've got hypersaline waters that are twice of what normal salinity of seawater, normal seawater So it's about salinity. 60 parts per thing. Yeah, well, 35 is, is about normal marine. So, yeah. And I think we, we actually have a range in Hamlin, but you could say it's around 60, 65 yep. is the average. And you've got, so you've got these temperatures, you've got these salinities, you've got crazy tides. I mean, and, and you're talking about the stromalites really growing around the margin of Hamlin, and they're on these low gradients often that... So during part of the year, they're completely exposed to air. And then during another part of the year, they're completely underwater. It's this organism that's not, it's not mobile. Like, it's not moving around. It's sitting there. And it has to be able to, like, really put up with this harsh environment. So you've got higher organisms that really, they just can't cope. They can't live with that. Mm. So you've got 
these microbial communities that are building stromalites that are going, hey, that's cool. I'm this, gonna thrive here. This, this is great. This niche environment. Yeah. This intertidal zone so niche and perfect for them. It yeah. kind of out. They're not necessarily surviving from the predators from you know becoming to outcompete them. They've just kind of found this. Like you say, Goldilocks zone, this intertidal yeah. zone that's perfect for them in tidal range mm-hmm. temperature and they can just thrive there. Yeah, and nobody else is competing with them. Fantastic. They're pretty happy with mm-hmm. that, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. So what was your research that when you were looking at Hamlin Pool, what were you looking for itself? Were you just looking to um, date these stromatolites? Um, we did some dating. Uh, we did do some dating. But I, what I really looked at was the different um, morphologies mm-hmm. and how that kind of relates to the slope of the intertidal, the gradient. And, yeah. um, and if you get different shapes and types of stromatolites that um, form in kind of predictable zonations or areas. Yep. And, and they do. Um, so my, my, my dissertation, my PhD, my PhD dissertation was called the Stromatolite Provinces of Hamlin Pool. And it's broken, we can break Hamlin down into eight different provinces with their areas of different energy, so different environmental pressures. So mm-hmm. the salinity gradient gets higher as you move away from the sill, where yep. it gets charged. Um, so the sill, the 4A sill, is the is the carbonate sand bank at the kind of the mouth of Hamlin that mm-hmm. allows water to come through from Greater Shark Bay. Mm-hmm. And so the water up there is less hypersaline. It's still hypersaline, but less. And then you get a gradient as you move south. Um, energy lessens as you move towards the southern part of the pool. Um, and they have different bathymetric gradients as you move around so that some areas uh, are really steep mm-hmm. and so it gets deep really quickly and some areas you have kilometers where it's just virtually flat. So you get really flat line sheet mats and different morphologies and some of them even self-organize maybe, which is very interesting for simple that is, bacteria. That is interesting. Yes. Does it, so they actually are self-organized or they kind of give the perception that maybe they're self-organized? Well, with... maybe we'll do some more research on that in the future. That would be awesome. It's, it's actually, we, we, so with NASA, we um, took 14 square kilometers of drone imagery at sub-centimeter resolution. Yeah. And the guy that I work with there, his name is um, Vaith Chariath, and he wrote an algorithm that does what they call fluid lensing, and it basically uses the package of water as a lens, so you're not limited by your focal length. So you remove the water from the system, so yeah. you're basically just left with what's there, which is phenomenal. And that's incredible because you have so much overlap in the imagery, you can build 3D stereo networks, which is just the guy is brilliant. And um, so we've got this imagery. It's not even all processed yet because the supercomputers have to do it, and it's like when it's done, it's expected to be like three petabytes worth of data. Which that's is a lot of data, <laughs> but. Up in the northeastern corner, there's this portion that we flew with the drone, and I'm looking at it going, this just this just can't be stromatolites. Like it just this looks like muscle beds. Like oh, it wow. just looks like muscle beds. And it's because of the way that it's organized, and it's because of the way the water flows, and it's because of the gradient, and it's because there's like these feedback loops that muscle self-organize. So then you're like, hmm. Uh, are these are these bacterial communities self-organizing as well? This is very interesting. So we haven't really. I mean, it's part of it. It's kind of like now what's I guess what's launched from that preliminary work. Yeah. And now we're building upon that and finding different avenues. And um, there's another PhD student working on the project right now, doing the morphometric analysis. So what does this all mean? That'd be incredible. If yeah. you when if and when you find out about that, that'd be great. If you could just send us the paper <laughs> and just have a quick look, I'd be fascinated. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So the way you you mentioned that you were using drones or mm-hmm. remote sensing technology to kind of view these mm-hmm. beds. Um, were you, what were your methodologies to take the samples, I suppose? Were you actually taking physical samples of yeah, these? Yeah, we did do. We took 45 stromatolite heads um, for the research. That mm-hmm. took a hell of a lot of permits to get. I think what was different about our approach is in the past, so the stromatolites were discovered in the 1950s, mm-hmm. and then there was some research done. There, you know, there's a bit, um, there was a group called Bass Becking that did work in the 70s and 80s, and I guess even before that, there was um, a group out of UWA with Brian Logan, and they made these AAPG memoirs, and they did some, some really good work. I call those books the Bibles, because they're like the blue books that are Bibles. They're a really good reference. And then you get some work in the, how do you say it, the late 2010s, or no, no, the late, two, yeah. 2007, two, two. 8, 9, 10. <laughs> late 2000s. <laughs> early yeah, early I know 2000s, you mean. I don't know here. Uh, <laughs> early 2000s, I think, if you're talking geological periods. <laughs> in the, uh, is it the Anthropocene there? 
Oh, when did that? Or oh, nineties? I think there's a lot of debate over that. They're yeah. saying or is, is it, it agricultural period, or are they saying it's when plastics were invented? It's. Uh, I, I mean, actually don't know. It's quite a high debated topic in, I suppose, the geology field, and they're trying to debate on when to define the Anthropocene. And there's a lot of debate saying, I think it should be with the industrial period. That's uh-huh. when, obviously, we've started making huge, significant changes to the atmosphere and, and stuff like that. Another person, when plastics were made, which is kind of the indust- bit past the industrial scene, because that's when we started to really damage small communities. Um, and then there's other people that are saying, going way back, and they're just saying, when man started to do use agriculture, because that's when we started fertilizing, that's when we started cultivating wow. the land, and that's when we started making significant augmentations or terraforming to that um, to land mass and thus the ecosystems and climate. And there's a, they haven't defined it, I suppose, scientifically yet. There's just it's a thing that they're debating, but they're the three. I think only those three are the significant ones that are really competing for that role. But we're living in the Anthropocene. We're living in the Anthropocene. I think we can summarise we're living in the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is now. So what, but what we did, I guess from all the research that was done previously, it's really, it's been focused on the southeastern margin of Hamlin Pool. Mm-hmm. We went in there for months every year and didn't just explore the southeastern margin. We explored all margins. Now it was, um, we tried to use toad video. And then okay. it's, it's actually really, really difficult to use toad video because you've got this subtitle pavement that's forming at um, sediment water interface mm-hmm. and it's often got sediment on it. it's often got this diatom scuzz on it it's you actually don't know if it's pavement or if it's not pavement and so here we're towing video and we're looking at these like kilometers of towed video going i actually don't know what that is, is it, i don't just, know what that is i don't know what that is and so it was not a very it, it, like it didn't work yeah so then we turned it ups into ups and downs filled work always <laughs> oh, ups and downs <laughs> that's the truth and so towing turned out to be much better because you could drop off the line and poke at it or, you know... Okay, yeah, I see how that's yeah, going to work. Yeah, it's so scientific. And poke at it. So okay. so I dropped off and poked at a lot of things scienti- and looked at it. Scientists use big, complicated words. <laughs> when you break it down, we're literally just like, you know, we're just scratching dirt or something like that. Yeah. And just give it a really technical, complicated name and you can just sound fancy. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's got to be a, a name, a more scientific name for poked. Though we poked, pr- prodded, prodded. <laughs> inspect, in closely inspected. We, yes, we, yes. Disturbed. We, we no, well, we we didn't disturb it. Okay. You don't want to say that in a World Heritage area. We good point. We examined <laughs> from afar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it was it, and it was good. And we um we made a map. Yep. Of, of the pool that instead of looking at just what the surface map of the stromatolite was mm-hmm. um, of actually what the shape is so it it puts Hamlin into more of a temporal kind of okay. uh, idea yeah. uh, I don't know because when you stromatolites have been classified as like pustular matte stromatolites or smooth matte stromatolites or coliform matte stromatolites which is all fine and good those yeah. are different types of microbial communities making a, a surface map but each type of microbial community lives within a certain range, like um, mm-hmm. depth range, because it, it has to, it's that Goldilocks zone, you know? This microbial community works best when it's dry 80% of the time, or when it's underwater 20% of the time, or I suppose that's the benefit of being a simple bacteria. You can, there's only a small amount of things that you really need to change to make yourself adapted to that area, but you're not going to be so diverse in yourself that you can physically adapt yourself. You just need small Tweaks. Genetic chain tweaks, yeah. I suppose. So if you map something based on what's the surface expression, mm-hmm. it only really tells you where the structure is, which is useful. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't really tell you what that stromatolite has been through time. Yeah. And so it would be like calling me a brunette, but maybe once I had blonde hair or it like, I don't know. The surface yeah, value. Good. Yeah, surface value. So it's so looking at, looking at a shape and how it's grown and how that's interacted with the environment over 2,000 years mm-hmm. is giving a more, um, I guess, temporal picture. Yep, which is important, which is, a, I suppose it's an extra layer, it's an extra depth yeah. to the actual research. What are there any, what are the implications, what are the um, applications of, or um, applications of knowledge of knowing this? Why, why is it important to know this? A lot of reasons. Um, I think one, and I think I mentioned this before, is that it is really that window mm-hmm. to the past that we don't, I mean, we can't like travel. Well, maybe someday we can, but we can't time travel and experience what that environment is like, what the what anything was like back yeah. then. And so this kind of gives us this picture, a snapshot in time, I guess. Mm-hmm. But then also it 
it allows us to kind of think outside of Earth. Even with like Mars, for example, it, perhaps Mars had an early atmosphere, like at the same time Earth was evolving, Mars was evolving. Yep. And in early Earth, early Mars, maybe Mars had an atmosphere at one time. And simple life evolved on Earth, maybe simple life evolved on Mars at that time too, then Mars lost its atmosphere and now mm-hmm. everything is gone and dead and whatever. But you might be able to find fossils yep. of life that were on Mars and you could... Um, so, so finding life is like finding a needle in a haystack. Finding evidence of life is like finding a needle in a haystack. Yep. And if you have a structure that's a shape that you know that that's maybe evidence of life, like that shape is not an, a shape because of erosion or a shape, it's actually like a buildup that was created by life. Yeah. Then you're actually really narrowing the size of your haystack. It's like, oh, let me look for a fossil in this shape because mm-hmm. that's a life shape. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you're looking, you're looking well. for... Um, I suppose, a recognized or correlated patterns of yeah. life, I suppose. Sign- life signatures, physical life signatures, yeah. the way that... Biosignatures. Biosignatures. There, you go. there is a word <laughs> for that. We got there. <laughs> um, yes, that's really fascinating. Or, or even beyond Mars, I mean, you could essentially take this elsewhere. And yeah, look across at... the billions and other billions of expanding universe, galaxies exactly. and planets and stars. I mean, we're still probably maybe a long way off from that. But oh, yeah. potentially you could do, like... Look, think about even the moons of different planets mm. in our current solar system. We have, I mean, who knows? There could be some sort of... I think there's a new, I don't know, again, not going to quote this, but I listen to a lot of science things and it kind of gets jumbled together. I think there's a new telescope coming out fairly soon um, that's planning on looking at, obviously, our visible universe again, kind of not replacing the Hubble scope. But all I know from it is in the first week of operation, it will gather more data than the Hubble scope teles- Hubble telescope has ever gathered over its whole operational period, so I can't. I don't know what they're actually looking at, but it's it's. Um, Where the hell do you store all the data? Like I have a, a huge, huge refrigerator <laughs> of servers. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have. I'm always curious now. Like you obviously got quantum computing, and that's going to yeah. eventually come about, and people are going to be able to get all this immense amount of data like science is almost theory in that way so rather than designing an experiment where you go i want to know this result so i'm going to aim for this it's more we're going to use this instrument gather immense amounts of data this is a bit especially prevalent in genetics that you're going to gather this immense amount of genetic data or any kind of scientific disciplines worth of data and as a scientist rather than going i'm going to Look, answer this question you look at the data for correlations and statistical analysis and you go that's interesting and you look at the huge amounts of data so you're going to become more of a a data miner than you are going to be a practical field scientist in the oh, future i think it's sad. going to i know it actually made me kind of sad <laughs> that science a little bit i was like oh i don't really want to do that i'm sure that there's still going to be a point for the practical and physical experimentation and field trips but like that's where i think and especially in science that's going to be more database like genetics and yeah. it'll be a sad day but it'll be i suppose it's that's the best way of looking at it. it's more efficient than looking at everything you can just create algorithms and computer everything's going to be they learn coding in primary school now i don't even that's coding. crazy yeah I, I i'm a terrible coder but um taking a bit of a segue so you, you're still looking into stromatolites but you're also working for bush heritage yeah. right and you're working looking into research for them now the primary form of your research initially at least anyway was looking at a baseline ecological survey. Is no, that well, that's currently what I'm doing. Yeah. That's currently what you're doing. Yeah. So Bush, Her- Bush Heritage is a is a not for profit environment and conservation organization, mm-hmm. and uh, it, was, it was started in the early 90s. We've been 25. It was started by Bob Brown, and uh, who's a former head of the Green Party. Yeah. Together with the partners that we have, we own and or manage about 6.2 million hectares across Australia. So it's a lot of, of land management. So this is a new kind of area for Bush Heritage. To um, In March last year, we purchased Tamlin Station, which is a 500,000-acre pastoral station, that's a pastoral big, lease. That's a lot of lawn mowing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's been done for uh, over 100 years by goats and sheep. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I still want to get a goat, man. This is a snow. <laughs> yeah, yes. no, my husband's a snow <laughs> as well. The, but the, last year, the former owner agreed to stay on for a year and he removed 17,000 animals from the property. And there's still animals to be removed, but that's, um, it'll be an ongoing process. But So the idea is to turn the pastoral lease into a conservation organization. Mm-hmm. Or, co- sorry, co- to turn the pastoral lease into a conservation area. Yep. And the 
if 500,000 acres borders the Shark Bay World Heritage Area mm -hmm. on the, what is that, the western side of Hamlin Station is borders Shark Bay, and it also borders then Hamlin Pool. Okay. And Shark Bay World Heritage Area is five million acres, so we like to think that buying Hamlin kind of extends the protection of the World Heritage Area another 10%. Shark Bay itself is, I think it's 70% water. I mean, 70% Shark Bay. It's Shark Bay. Yeah, so it's a bay. It's a bay. Um, and so it's kind of that, how does the land influence the water? How does land management help mm -hmm. the health of... Yeah, the, the marine pool. community. Yeah, exactly. And Hamlin Pool is a marine nature reserve. It's the only marine nature reserve in Western Australia, for sure. Really? Yeah. And That's incredibly surprising. Yeah, which means it's afforded the highest so, level of protection. Like it's, so Shark Bay itself is a double bay inlet. Okay. And so the 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 furthest seaward bay is just a, it's called Henry Fresne, mm -hmm. and it's like just a big long inlet. And yep. then the second one comes down, and I think it's Disappointment Reach. No, Disappointment Reach is the other side. It's that's oh, such a depressing name. I know, I know. They're all... <laughs> <laughs> they are, there's like useless loop. There's a whole bunch of them. Anyhow, it comes down... It is Disappoint Reach, and it comes down... That's the inlet it comes around. Everybody knows Monkey Maya from, yeah. from Shark Bay. So that's the coast that comes down, or the, the inlet that comes down on the eastern side of, of the Perrin Peninsula, where Monkey mm -hmm. Maya is. And then there's a seal, and then it goes into Hamlin Pool. So it's kind of this double bay inlet. But... Hamlin's barred off from the rest of Shark Bay except for this one main channel that comes through and then it's got yeah, stromatolites all Hence why it's so market. highly saline, I suppose yeah. it's like high levels of evaporation is pretty much keeping that yeah. as dense as it is. So oh. Bush, so Bush yeah. Heritage bought this property for the conservation value, for, for the land but also for the the water aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so so one of our, um, in our conservation action plan, one of our targets is Hamlin Pool. And the health of the pool is important and uh, everything about the pool is important. Well, yeah. to me, everything about the pool is important. Uh, <laughs> but the um, what's interesting is that there's been kind of the geological studies that have been done there on stromatolites and the microbial mats and things over time. Uh, but nobody's ever done any type of survey on what what lives in the pool. So, so you know, people want to say that, oh, stromatolites, uh, these microbial communities that built stromatolites, they were grazed out of existence. They were grazed out of existence. They were grazed out of existence. Like, that's hammered in, hammered in, hammered in. Mm. Like, that's what, well, it's not really that. You know, it's a competition of space that they have to be in this certain zone. Like, all this stuff happens. But you get out to Hamlin. I remember in 2000, I think it was 12, I had a student come out there on the trip with us. And he said, oh, my God, there's fish in there. Well, yes, of course there's fish in there. But it if you get it locked in your brain that like there's nothing else that can live there yeah. at all only these microbes can live there then it, it can like be it, a bit of a surprising yeah. kind of contradictive shock to what you've been kind yeah. of like you said trained to believe I suppose you haven't been there to yourself so you're going to hearsay is going to be what so you're it's, going it's on. like dead and that there's microbes yeah. so the pool itself is dead but you get these microbic communities yeah whereas I suppose you've got this um, marine community yeah and it's, it's kind of like a well what we're finding is it's you know it's low in diversity but a lot higher in diversity than was expected mm. and so we've just done this this whole campaign in fact i've just come back from that um dropping baited remote underwater video stations which are called bruvs and you we did um about 170 drops and we still okay. have a few more to get done how deep is the pool uh, max is 11 meters. 11 meters, so you were doing kind of vertical? They were habitat focused. So, okay. we, you know, looking at sediments or looking at stromatolites or looking at pavements or looking at yeah. seagrass or different types of habitats where different things could live. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, lastly, I want to ask, when you say baited, mm -hmm. um, obviously I'm imagining just an underwater camera going down, mm -hmm. but you've got baited. So what does that imply? Are you putting a food source on there to attract... Yeah. Any select species that you got so down there. It's pil it, in Australia, we use pilchards for bruvs, which is a type of sardine. It's a real oily yeah. fish. So that goes down, and even when it drops. So they're stereo. They're these stereo cameras that kind of look out that way, and mm -hmm. then you can do measurements with them and look at the size of things because you've got the stereo imagery. Yeah. Um, but when you drop that, you, you do see this oily like plume come out from it that you know then brings all the fish in and yeah you want something nice and oily nice yeah. and smelly get a yeah. bigger catchment area for it yeah. um what is the diversity or what did you find like how what did you what species did you find down there and is there a lot of fish are they more and what makes them i know it's going to be a big question but what makes them adapted to live in this highly saline 
marine environment? I don't have the answers for that yet. Okay. I only because we've just we've just come back last week. Yep. And um, we we did start to take a look at the data this week, and it's surprising. Um, but there's there are pink snapper and cod and really? other things that we didn't expect to find. Wow. And yeah, so I'm 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 interested to see how that kind of does evolve and yeah and yeah. I, I'm not too sure if you'll be able to answer this, but for any species like pink snapper or cod that are usually obviously they're open water or clo- kind of semi coastal marine species, their usual kind of living conditions are 35 uh, parts per thousand. See, this is double, like you've said, 65, mm. 70. Have they gone under any evolution or any genetic? A modification to allow them to adapt to live in this area. I'm not sure if you know. Would they have? I, I don't. I don't know. But I. I do think that that's really interesting, and it's an interesting question to think about because so the pool has Phragum aerogatum, which is this little bivalve, and okay. it's because of the really extreme conditions. There's low diversity, but really high abundance of this one particular cockle shell, and it's. It's, it's a really fascinating little shell. It's got like zooxanthellae in it, kind of like a coral does, and it yeah. just really thrives oh, really? and it's everywhere. Yeah. Does it oh, use the zooxanthellae at the same time as coral? Uh, well, it, it's, it has the zooxanthellae in its mantle. Yeah. And so the zooxanthellae are, fo- because it's a nutrient poor environment, they're, yeah, they're photosynthesizing and they're providing nutrients for this bivalve, essentially. So they're everywhere. That's incredible. Bivalves. Yeah, oh, it's, it's amazing. Helen Pool's amazing. And I'm going there next time I go north. Yes, Done. you should do. You should do. And um, so it's, it's like you know that this bivalve, when it when it starts to really show up in abundance, it's about five thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. So you know that the pool became restricted at that time because you start to see this monospecific bivalve. Yep. And you have to ask yourself if this pool's been barred off for five thousand years. It's been a restricted environment for five thousand years. Do these fish that live here? Do they just live in Hamlin, or do they come in? And, I mean, there's not really a lot to eat there. It's nutrient poor. Yeah. Like, do they? Do they come in? Do they go out? Do they stay there? Do they? And you have to think over thousands of years, there has to be some sort of specialization or some sort yeah. of some change happening for them for that to be a suitable environment for them. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. I'd be fascinated to see what what causes these species to, to dominate, I suppose, mm-hmm. or survive so prevalently in this area. Um, I assume the implications of doing a baseline ecological assessment are to take into account any environmental change or significant yeah. impacts that happen globally. A- absolutely. And I think one of our, and one of the big triggers for this baseline study mm-hmm. um, is that in 2010, 2011, there was a huge heat wave in Shark, in Shark Bay and the sea surface temperature raised like five degrees above normal for a long period of time. And you saw huge, um, a huge decimation in seagrass. And the seagrass is, uh, that's what the dugongs, there's a huge population of dugongs in Shark Bay. They, you know, live on the seagrass. The turtles, like, the seagrass is really critical. It's, a, it's, it's like the, the life force of Shark Bay, essentially. And seagrass is very important. Yeah, it's, it's, like the blue, the, it, it's a blue carbon. It's, it's like seagrasses, exactly. yeah. The seagrass, they kind of, they're blue carbon, but they also make localized water a bit more alkaline as opposed to the incre- increasing pH of or in ocean acidification, like kind of the brother of global warming. And I was looking at what is the significance and impact of how far, the extent in which they make the water more alkaline and can you utilize this as more of a management tool? Can you use this, like, could you put it as a ring around coral reefs to maybe make them a bit That's more phenomenal. safe or yeah, tolerant to the actual increasing ocean acidification? Could you just increase the abundance of them in a localized area, not necessarily straight? I'd like, I wanted to look into that, but we, I got told last week I didn't get the funding. Yeah, that's what I want to look into, use it as a management tool. Which... That's wonderful. Oh, my mind is just going like, Yeah, I know. Because it's, well, it, in the water in, in Hamlin is slightly alkaline and like, you know, and you've got the, this big seagrass bank that's at the top of it that's coming down. and oh, Yeah, if the full flow of water comes down, that's why I want to see if they flow. Obviously, they make their local water alkaline, but if you put it in, in line with the direction of flow, mm-hmm. could that influence of local alkaline water be dragged down? And if it does, how significant or how concentrated would that water um, mass be, I suppose? Oh, that, that could be an interesting PhD project for Hamlin. I would love to do it. Throw it in a Bush Heritage if I want to take anyone on. <laughs> Tell them I'm free. Yes, definitely. That's a, that's a great project, though. Actually, seagrasses in general, that's a great project. Mm. 
They're like the rain, tropical rainforests of, I mean, everyone loves coral reefs because they initially are pretty, mm-hmm. but if you look at the species, the diversity and the abundance of all organisms, you've got micro and macro algae that grow on leaves, mm-hmm. and you've got species that use them as a nursery and ground or even just a habitat and they migrate in and out. Mm-hmm. The, what I think it's the mangrove seagrass reef continuum, I think it's called, which is like a community of three ecosystems acting independently, but they also act as a overall ecosystem to support like the lifespan of various marine organisms oh, that's fascinating mm. that is and it's so sharp bay you've got the mangroves you've got the seagrass and yeah you've got it's like the perfect life. system <laughs> it's preserved it's fantastic yeah. wow oh that's yeah. interesting I'm trying to remember where we were now what were we talking about ah the temperature yes yeah so there was the, the extreme weather event extreme temperature event and the thing is we don't actually know what happened in hamlin because there's no baseline data. So in order to be able to predict future change, future impacts, future effects, and even to understand what's happened mm-hmm. in the past decade, or it's, I mean, it's critical to have a baseline. Oh, of course, you need that foundation to mm-hmm. know any fluctuations that occur. Mm-hmm. Well, it's incredibly important, especially if you're looking for a conservational purpose and want to manage that area. With the baseline data, um, are they looking to implement management techniques to maybe, best way of putting this, have they got management techniques in mind that they want to use in Hamilton Pool? Year ago, just a few months ago, I published a paper on, um, it, it, it talked about the implications of groundwater mm-hmm. to the area. And so I think beyond just the management of looking at like the, um, the fauna assemblage, it's also how the land impacts the water. And I think that before we can make any type of management decisions, mm. we kind of have to get the whole picture, which we totally don't have, which is so surprising because you're looking at a World Heritage Area. You've got Hamlin, which is the highest level of oh. protection. Yeah, but yeah, I, I agree. Like it's incredibly important to have this baseline. And once you've got that baseline of one area, you kind of want to see mm-hmm. it's it's not a, a closed system. It's got no closed boundaries, n- no environment right. has closed boundaries but but it is restricted which which means that really i think you you are having water come in from greater shark bay i mean obviously yeah. that's, that's the recharge but there's also the impact coming from land and mm-hmm. it, it, it's it, and i think with the future it's predicted that we're going to have more frequent extreme weather events and yes. warming events and things like that happening and and intensity of them as well yes which is the biggest significance. Like the, uh, I'm assuming the heat warming event you were talking about, I think it was the La Nina? I think uh, it was La Nina, La actually. Nina, yeah. yeah. La Nina event of 2011 that brought yeah. down an extremely warm level of water that mm. kind of persisted for an extra little bit longer than it normally does. And I can't remember the degree change, but it was like... I think like it was deg- five. It was like five degrees. Yeah. So something significant. It's It will cause... It's a lot of coral in Coral Bay is still recovering from the similar event, which is mm. just north. When I went there recently, and I did a show earlier with the... Uh, coral biologist and we went there and there's areas that are destroyed by tourism but there's also areas, there's it's still quite well preserved but there are still a lot of areas that have suffered bleaching from the warming event that i mean it's slowly recovering because it's well it's damaging it is and especially if you've got organisms like like those bivalves living off the zoanthelli mm-hmm. down there it's the zoanthelli they get stressed during the warming yeah. period which release a toxic chemical so if that's still an implemented factor down there there's that's going to be a, there's another phd actually. there's another phd down there <laughs> <laughs> I can provide ideas. I can't get them, so feel free to use the show. So, um, as a brief summary, um, from a very diverse segue, as a brief summary, could you give us a nice little summary of the system of Hamlin Pool? What you know about it so far? So you've got the groundwater deposits, you've got the marine community itself, and where they plan to go from it with it from there. Summary? Yeah. Hamlin Pool is the most phenomenal place on the planet. Drop the mic. <laughs> no, uh, it's it, it's it's a really um, there's I mean there's no other place like it on the planet because this is the only place that this is really happening. Mm. The the stromalites in the Bahamas form for a completely different reason than the stromalites form in Hamlin. Yeah. Um, so you've got this hypersaline alkaline restricted environment. That's got a unique species assemblage, which we haven't completely uncovered yet. Mm -hmm. And it's got microbial deposits forming all around the shoreline. That's possibly a great nursery for lots of organisms because it's, you know, providing that kind of little hidey holes and then, you know. Were there any limitations to your research that you recently conducted, apart from your drive home where your gearbox cocked it? (laughs) 
<laughs> Typical field work, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by limitations? Um, limitations are as in the data you're collecting. Were there any limitations in the way you went about collecting data or methodol- limitations related to your methodology? So technical limitations. So we worked in collaboration with the Department of Parks and Wildlife and they provided the, the, the gear yep. to actually conduct the survey, which is wonderful. And you have to have heaps of permits to conduct the surveys as well. Mm-hmm. So we have a, a boat, a, a beautiful, majestic vessel. It's brand mm-hmm. new for Bush Heritage. It's called the Hamlin Explorer, and it's like specially built to tool around Hamlin. It's a really shallow draft, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful vessel. Oh, it's a lovely vessel. Send us did a picture I, of that. Did well. I mention it was a lovely vessel? I, I, <laughs> where were we? Lovely vessel, that was right. <laughs> Um, and so we have one place that we can launch in Hamlin and the water levels seasonally are a lot lower during this time of the year than they are um, in like February, March. They're a lot higher. So we have limitations with launching often because the water is so low that you can't. So what is the tidal range of there? You said it was quite a significant tidal range. Yeah. I know in the Pilbara region and Broome it goes 8 to 12 meters at uh, times. Yeah. But what is it? No, it's not in Hamlin like that at all. It's um, It's... Over the course of the day, it's maybe 60 centimeters or something. But over the course of a year, mm. it, it's quite large because you, and it's not, not your seven to 10 meters or anything like that, but you know, maybe like, a, I think it's close to two meters over the course of a year. So I had a physical oceanographer model the tides for yeah. Hamlin. And I don't, I don't know enough about it, so I can't really comment on that, but I know that he took, he did a harmonic analysis, correct? Yeah. Um, so 20%, 20% of the tides in Hamlin are astronomical. But then there's another 20% that's really a seasonal effect, which is high evaporation in summer, um, mm-hmm. high precipitation in winter, different like that, that affect the levels yep. of water. And then there's this huge like 60% meteorological component because it's barred at the sill. Yep. And it's it kind of is acting like a so lake in a sense or whatever. It's like a getting, wind is just like pushing the water up on one side or pulling it away from one side or whatnot. So it, it, they're kind of unpredictable. Like you could look at the tide and say, oh, it's going to be high tide at five o'clock mm-hmm. today. And then you have a high tide for 20 hours because, <laughs> because you've got the wind pushing, it's, pushing um, up there. And a probably more common analogy, if anyone is an oceanographer and listening, is the Strait of Gibraltar and the Mediterranean Sea. And that acts again. It's like a seal that comes across. It's a lot. It's a lot shallower, uh, deeper than what we're talking about. But it goes in there, and the salinity of um, the Mediterranean Sea is much higher because that seal keeps entraps a certain amount of water in there, and the evaporation obviously causes it to become more dense. And that denser water sinks to the bottom, and then that becomes a dominant water mass supply that's stratified in that area that doesn't quite get over the lip unless there's a strong meteorological event that causes that intense mixing. And then otherwise it just retains this other surface layer that's got a bit more of a flow to it. But I suppose Mm. what you're talking about is a much shallower scale where you've still got this thin layer of uh, surge water that just comes in and out and is affected by the tides and winds and meteorological events. But deeper i suppose you've got this more well because have you got the no, no. environment because it's because it's so shallow it's 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 not really stratified it's really well mixed but you, that makes sense you do have in the basin in the southern portion this whole area where it's like all of the sediments are just black gunk like completely anoxic and whatnot but still you're getting good mixing of the water and in fact in fact, that's an interesting point because the name for um, the Aboriginal word for Hamlin Pool is um, Bulagoda, which okay. means black waters. And the question is, why does that mean black waters? And uh, I need to do some chasing down to actually figure that out. But I, I could imagine, um, only because reports of it, like after a huge storm, cyclones, things like that, that mm-hmm. anoxic bit gets really turned up. Yep. And the waters would turn black from that. So what's next for you? Like, are you continuing on with this research? Uh, Is this going to take a lot? Because there's still a lot of unknowns that we've discussed. So I suppose that's going to be taking a lot of your time. I, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I could work in Hamlin for the rest of my life. Like I could work, there's, you know, you answer one question and you get 10 more. Yeah. So I think there's, there's endless work in Hamlin and, um, and, and Bush Heritage uh, plans to own and protect the property into perpetuity. So, I mean, I'm, mm. I, I would love to continue working in Hamlin. And I, I think that uh, the, the opportunities there are great. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that Bush Heritage would like to do in the future is to put um, a, a, a facility there that has a large science capacity and outreach and citizen science aspect and a lot that of things like that. That would be incredible. Yeah. Like, that would be 
as far as I'm aware of, that'll be one of the first globally significant sit science outreach conservation areas where you go there. I mean, you can do paid tourism to go like to, to Galapagos, but <laughs> yeah, to actually go there, learn about the, mm. the actual conservation and stuff itself. I don't. It, that'd be awesome. It'd be mm. like a, you know, like you said, a heritage zoo. But yeah. That'd be great. I really hope they pull through with that. Yeah. That'd be incredible. And then as long as it's sustainable and people don't go tromping through the waters and trash it up, mm-hmm. which is always the risk with tourism. Yes, it is. It is indeed. Yeah. But but that's also a point of having very control. I mean, and it's like the point we said earlier, you, you don't want to have a mausoleum where you lock it all up and you can't let anybody in and look at it and, you know, no science, no, like nothing going on because this is, it needs to be protected. And the mm. best way that we can protect it is to put a lock on it. Like, I, I believe that if you educate, then you are protecting and you are preserving. You don't need that lock because essentially you're providing the knowledge to someone who then understands and also can be an advocate to say, well, this is important because we need to protect our planet. We need to protect the stromatolites, you yeah. know. But the, the scary thing is, is that it, like we potentially could lose the system with sea level rise, with different things that are happening. Like, and that's it. Then what? And it's gone. So we need to, I mean, I, we need to let everyone be aware and, and, I, and advocate. <laughs> I agree. Because like the whole kind of shebang of it may sound small scale, but recycle to a point that that's going to help on a small level and then believe in climate change. <laughs> yeah. So I, like, I usually end the show or try and ask for, do you have a take home message for the audience? Do you have an advocate? Do you, do you want to advocate for anything? Do you have like a good um, message to send to people? And I mean, that's a really good one right there just it's happening and it's scary but look after it education is key um, outreach to anyone you know and teach them how to manage and care for a, a sensitive environment i suppose yeah like not everything is so robust as a city you can't just drop stuff on the floor and someone's going to pick it up for you when you go to a beautiful area if that's what you want to see take care of it i think uh, my biggest message would be that um this planet does not belong to us we belong to this planet and we need to respect that and i agree and that's incredibly important when you take into account the how long your cyanobacteria has been about and then we're a microscopic number uh, number of existence yeah. on this planet yeah. The planet, if, any, if it belongs to any living organism, it's those guys. <laughs> it's the stromatolites. It's stromatolites. Do you know, I, I often say when I teach, like, if you start Earth history at my nose yeah. and you go out to the end of my fingertips, if you take the shaving of my fingernail, that's humans, that's us. Yes. And you have 80% of this timeline is, str- is stromatolites. There's these mm. microbial communities, right, that are building stromatolites, leaving that in the rock record. Like, who are we as humans? We are a shaving. We're like a, a breath of time. Yeah. And you've got this longevity, this, this, oh, it's, it's mind boggling how actually long that is. Like, I, that's one of the reasons I love stromatolites is because you cannot wrap your brain around that. Like, that is a huge amount of time. Like, it's just mind boggling. And then going back to the anthrop- anthropogenic scene, we've been around for such a short period of time, yeah. but we've already caused such a, a dramatic geological event. Stromatolites may rise again. That was the, that's my end point. Like, when, if we were to be gone, yeah. stromatolites, uh, chances are they will persist. Yeah. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on the show. It's great to have <laughs> I you. Know, we had heaps of segues there. We had heaps of segues. I love segues. Yeah. And that's it for the show today, guys. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you again, Erica, for allowing me to have this discussion with you. It was fantastic talking, and I hope you learned something new. Like I said at the beginning of the show, if you want to showcase your music and you want to design us an intro and outro for the show and win a t-shirt, contact us for details and also just just start designing. I can't wait to see what you guys come out with. Anyway, thank you very much and I hope to hear from you soon. Take care. Bye. The 80% protein. Are they really? Yeah. I did not know that. If you're down there and you're starving and there's nothing to eat... <laughs> Have some pasta with that. Take a chomp out of that stromatolite. Yeah, but you wonder, like, do the goats munch on it, or do the emus munch on it, or like, does anybody munch you on it? Should leave one of your just... cameras just there for a short period to see if that happens. Watching out just to see like who's munching on it. Yeah. yeah.